it has been my tradition during my five years of ministry here so far, and five years somehow feels like both a long time and not a long time all at once. It's been my tradition to make the service on graduation weekend, on Mother's Day weekend, a poetry service. To shape a service around either a particular poet or a variety of poems that share a common theme. Truthfully though, as the calendar turned to May this year, I found my self-doubting a little bit. I found myself thinking about the state of the world, and I found myself growing in despair. Despairing over mass shootings at high schools and universities, synagogues and mosques, raging on behalf of our young people, on behalf of our faithful people, raging against the shameful and sinful inaction of those with the power to change. Despairing over the constitutional crisis in our capital, its criminality, corruption, conspiracy, and collusion, the failures of our systems of checks and balances, and despairing anew over each new horrifying and terrifying attack on women's reproductive health, each new report of environmental devastation due to our addiction to fossil fuel. I trust you know what I'm talking about, and I trust that I am not alone in feeling these things these days. And then, as if by some divine intervention, I received a different kind of input. A brand new book crossed my path, new book by Adrian Marie Brown. Adrian Marie Brown is an activist, an educator, and she is at the forefront of some of the most important social movements of our time. Let me put it to you this way. If we could elect a ruler of the world, and allow them to make all the rules, and that ruler of the world was Adrian Marie Brown, I'd be pretty okay with that. <laughs> Her new book took me a little aback because it is entitled Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good. And I wasn't quite sure how to feel about that, but here's what she does in the book. Coming from a perspective of social justice activism and social change, she makes the case that pleasure is a measure of freedom. She urges her readers to decrease any internal or projected shame or scarcity thinking around the pursuit of pleasure and to create more room for joy, wholeness, and aliveness. And in doing so, less room for oppression repression and unnecessary suffering. Adrienne Marie Brown's writing invites the reader to begin to understand the liberation possible were we to collectively orient around pleasure and longing. I read it and I struggled with it and then I read it and it began to sink in. Here are her words. Pleasure is a feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. Activism consists of efforts to promote, impede, or direct social, political, economic, or environmental reform or stasis with the desire to make improvements to society. Pleasure activism is the work we do to reclaim our whole, happy, and satisfiable selves from impacts, delusions, and limitations of oppression or supremacy. Pleasure activism, she continues, asserts that we all need and deserve pleasure and that our social structures must reflect this. In this moment, she says, we must prioritize the pleasure of those most impacted by oppression. Pleasure activism, she writes, includes work and life lived in the realms of satisfaction, 
joy, and erotic aliveness that bring about social and political change. Ultimately, she concludes, pleasure activism is us learning to make justice and liberation the most pleasurable experiences we can have on this planet. What do y'all think about that? I said, wow. Or as Adrienne Marie Brown says, wows her pants. Because <laughs> she's got some humor, too. It's important to note that as Adrienne Marie Brown writes about pleasure, she is not advocating escapism, nor is she advocating some kind of greedy excess. She writes, a central aspect of pleasure activism is tapping into the natural abundance that exists within and between us and between our species and this planet. It is what our bodies, our human systems are structured for. It is the aliveness and awakening, the gratitude and humility, the joy and celebration of being miraculous. And so it was inspired by this book by Adrienne Marie Brown that I chose the subject of poetry of ecstasy. Seeing where it went. I took her theory as the guide and this was the result. I want to say a few words about ecstasy. Ecstasy is a form of pleasure and a form of rapturous delight but I want, to go, I want to go one step further and give ecstasy an even deeper meaning, for I believe it involves an experience that is both deeply embodied and also transcendent. Deeply embodied, it is experienced within the body. And transcendent, it takes us out of our egos and outside of our socially constructed selves. Both grounds us and liberates us. Book got me thinking of what we need to do, how we might live in a way that is both more grounded and more liberated. But here is the point, the point I want to make about ecstasy. For the poets of ecstasy, there is an embrace of pleasure, an embrace of the ecstatic that is not a fleeting from the world. Let's take the Mary Oliver poem on poppies. Now, it may be kind of a stretch to consider Mary Oliver to be an ecstatic poet, or maybe not. But as I read the full poem, from which a section was our chalice lighting, I invite you to consider, to reflect on the interplay, the tension between pain and pleasure, agony and ecstasy, with which she grounds her vision of the world. Poppies. The poppies send up their orange flares, swaying in the wind, their congregations are a levitation of bright dust, of thin and lacy leaves. There isn't a place in this world that doesn't sooner or later drown in the indigos of darkness, but now, for a while, the roughage shines like a miracle as it floats above everything with its yellow hair. Of course, nothing stops the cold, black, curved blade from hooking forward. Of course, loss is the great lesson. But I also say this, that light is an invitation to happiness, and that happiness, when it's done right, is a kind of holiness, palpable and redemptive. Inside the bright fields, touched by their rough and spongy gold, I am washed and washed in the river of earthly delight. And what are you going to do? What can you do about it? Deep blue night. I'm struck by the image of Walt Whitman, who first published Leaves of Grass in 1855 and then went to work for several years as a nurse during the Civil War, tending to broken bodies and broken souls. And then afterwards, for the rest of his life, or 30 years after the end of the Civil War, he continued to republish 
and revise and republish and revise and expand upon his leaves of grass continue to sing the body electric. And Roske, let me tell you about Roske. I could choose so many of his poems dipping, dripping as they are deep with pleasure. His poem, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, his wedding poem, which I'll read a little later, his poem, To the Fig Tree on Ninth and Christian, in which he describes in an urban environment often thought to be blighted and dangerous, a communion of people pressing intimately against one another while sharing the sticky sweetness of a fig. In the poem I read earlier in the service, and everything on this earth, little dreamer, little dreamer of the new world, everything on this earth holy, every raindrop and sand grain and blade of grass worthy of gasp and love and joy. could have just as easily chosen other poems by Roske. The poem he wrote as tribute to Eric Garner after Eric Garner was choked to death by police officers on Staten Island. The poem he wrote entitled, Pulled Over in Short Hills, New Jersey, 8 a.m. The poem he wrote entitled, and get a load of this title, Within two weeks, the African-American poet Ross Gay is mistaken for both the African-American poet Terence Hayes and the African-American poet Kyle Dargan, not one of whom looks anything like the others. <laughs> <laughs> what a title of a poem, huh? And I say all of that to wonder. To wonder, what does it mean for Ross Gay, for Walt Whitman, for Mary Oliver, to all experience ecstasy in the midst of, in the face of, despite the reality of trauma, loss, repression, oppression. What does it mean? Mary Oliver to sing the praises of the poppies while the cold, dark blade blooms? What does it mean for Walt Whitman to sing the body electric amidst bodies deeply injured? What does it mean for Ross Gay to write a poem about a wedding? faces struggles. And might we consider, might we consider their ecstatic poetry a kind of pleasure activism? What does it mean that the gifts of these poems are given to us? What ought we to do with them? Perhaps Perhaps it is when we are in touch with that ecstasy, in touch with that embodied transcendence, in touch with that feeling of awe and wonder and pleasure and liberation. Perhaps it is then that we are most invited, most instructed, most inspired to live justice, transformation, and change. Those are the thoughts I leave you with today. But before I leave you, I leave you with one closing poem, since it is Poetry Sunday. This is a poem by Ross Yeh, entitled Wedding Poem for Keith and Jen. And I want to, before I begin, I want to just 
invite you to imagine that you are at a wedding for two people you love. And I want you to imagine a community gathered around, sending all of their best and hopeful thoughts, loving feelings. And I want you to imagine these words read as a gift, not only as a gift to the couple, but a gift to us all. Do you imagine me? So I give you Ross Gay's wedding home for Keith and Jen. <coughs> Friends, I am here to modestly report seeing in an orchard in my town a goldfinch kissing a sunflower again and again, dangling upside down by its tiny claws, steadying itself by snapping open like an old-timey fan its wings again and again, until, swooning, it tumbled off and swooped back to the very same perch where the sunflower curled its giant swirling of seeds around the bird and leaned back to admire the soft wind nudging the bird's plumage. And friends, I could see the points on the sun on the flower's stately crown soften and curl inward as it almost indiscernibly lifted the food of its body to the bird's nuzzling mouth whose fervor I could hear from oh, 20 or 30 feet away, and see from the tiny hulls that sailed from their good racket, which good racket, I have to say, was making me blush, and rock up on my tippy toes and just barely purse my lips with what I realize now was being simply glad, which such love, if we let it, makes us feel. Standing and we're going to sing together Ode to Joy, number 29, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, and let us sing it in an embodied, joyful way. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn. 